Hi, it's Mark from Top Local. I'm here with Simon Kelly of InSync Physio in Vancouver, one of Vancouver's most popular physiotherapy clinics, many time winners of best physiotherapists in Vancouver. And today we're going to talk about a really common issue, shin splints. How are you doing, Simon? Uh, how's it going, Mark? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, shin splints, Mark. I'll talk a little bit generally about the topic and I might relate it to a recent case study I had a bit as well. We've all heard of, of shin splints, the layman term, but we call it ATSS, which is anterior tibial stress syndrome, which sounds a bit fancier. That's more so pain to the front of the shin and more to the outside of the shin. And then you have MTSS, which is medial tibial stress syndrome. That's probably the more common one where you feel it more distally or at the end of your leg, sort of on the inside of the shin bone. So a lot of people kind of get this pain when they kind of increase their running too quickly, essentially. Uh, a lot of pain down on the inside of that chain, or sometimes it can be a change in footwear, a change in surface, um, and things like that. So it's important, obviously, to diagnose if the person take up running or any sort of activity, like lots of jumping, lots of high impact activities that's kind of leading to this kind of pain. And it's also very important not to run through this pain because uh, it can develop stress fractures or another thing called exertional compartment syndrome so our job would really be deciphering is it actually true shin splints because that's like an umbrella term or is it one of those other two things but very important not to run through that pain some injuries yes it's okay to run through it a little bit and just kind of monitor it but certainly if you keep going you can develop that stress type fracture stuff which pain is very full on the on the shin shin splints is more diffuse where you kind of feel it along the shin bone for like three or four inches. That's kind of how we decipher it a little bit as well. And obviously an x-ray will tell you if you do have a stress fracture. And the exertional compartment syndrome, usually pain just comes on after you start the exercise because blood is filling into the compartment of the lower leg. And then it expands and there's a mesh around the lower leg and it can expand out actually. So that's when you know that that's the difference in it. And you might have tingling in your lower leg very important not to continue that because you can create nerve damage and things like that so how do you diagnose it just by the pain yeah good, good question mark well first of all you take the history and you kind of ask them how to do lots of running it doesn't have to be running necessarily it can be like lots and lots of walking even. a lot of people are doing ten thousand steps lately i don't know why humans have a fixation on it if you do 10,000 steps every day and you're not really used to it, you can develop it from walking as well. Or even just a combination of running and walking might just throw, throw you over the edge to develop this too. When the person comes in, they'll usually say, yeah, I feel this at nighttime or sometimes after the walk. You don't always feel it while they're doing the activity, actually. So you will feel it at rest and you will feel it when you push along the inside of your shin bone or the outside of your shin bone. So that's kind of how we diagnose it, as opposed to exertional um, apartment syndrome is more, you just feel it after a few minutes of getting into the exercises that increases the blood flow. But the minute you stop, there's no pain at rest. There's actually no pain when you push it either. So there are kind of two big differentiating factors. Um, you don't want to keep running through it. Like I said, it's very important that you don't. And it's important that we look at the footwear and the surface. If you're a lot of the times people run on um, concrete, which is quite unforgiving under the foot, um, it's better to run on maybe grass. Um, some trails are sometimes better if there's not huge amounts of inclines and declines. So we try and alter that as well. Usually for the treatment part of it, I just stop them running for maybe a week or two completely and then just reload it very, very gradually. And we do a lot of stuff here in the clinic, a lot of massage, some needling of those muscles that join on, onto the inside of the shin, especially. They usually say it's because of the calf muscle that joins in at the back, which is responsible when we come down from running or from a jump. It's just micro tearing on the inside. And basically the micro tears aren't getting a chance to heal before somebody goes running again. And then it just develops into this lots of pain. So so the, the treatment protocol is pretty straightforward, but what if I wanted to prevent it? If I'm going to up my mileage, I'm going to engage in a new fitness program. Is there things that I could do that would help it with rolling my shins? <laughs> Very yeah. nice as an experience, uh, but would that help? Yeah, you could roll out your shins, Mark. And honestly, it really is just listening to your body a little bit, you know, how much you can load, how quick, you know, 
and there's no real magic answer to that. There's every individual is slightly different on how much, but usually people will come in and say, they might say something like after my fifth kilometer, it starts to come on a little bit and then it's worse afterwards. So you kind of have an idea in relation to that individual, like five kilometers is kind of where we're at right now. So that's your limit. And maybe they might take a day off and back again, or they might do it again the following day. So you'd really have to just, it's a bit of trial and error there. Rolling it out, strengthening up your calf muscles in particular are definitely stuff to do to try and prevent it from happening. Sometimes if it's more chronic or you've tried a few techniques here in physio, you can go maybe to a podiatrist and look at insoles. There is a bit of a link in some of the literature saying that like an overpronated foot or a flat foot can definitely predispose you as well. But so I'd like to try and not give people insoles right off the bat and see if we could get it right. But that's something I might come back to if we tried everything in our tool bag and it didn't work. That would be something I'd look into. Too. And this is just a, from a personal interest kind of point. Is there any research around the new kind of movement towards going more towards barefoot shoes, like the really non-supportive shoes that you wear that strength, your foot has to strengthen rather than being over supported? Yeah, there's a lot of research out there, Mark. And even there's, I think it's like everything in the world. You could find 10 research papers that say that for the pros of, of barefoot running, and that's how we were back in the wild, back in the day, running around, hunter and gatherers. Like there was no need for all this support. Why do we have it now? But then there's other arguments saying, like, well, we didn't have time with the concrete and a lot of hard surfaces that we're running on now. So that's a very good question. It's a very good question. When I started my physical career, I was sort of told that insoles were the way to go. But as I developed throughout my career, I sort of, it's only from a personal perspective that I don't want someone to have something in their foot forever if they really don't need it. But I'm not negating get, getting an insole. But if you've tried everything else, then I kind of go back to the insole as I think it is beneficial in definitely some scenarios for sure. Especially if someone is an athlete and really want to continue through their running or they're in competition and they can't really afford to wait and go towards insoles for sure. And what kind of length of treatment are we looking at? What's a typical, I know it's individual, of course, maybe this is really individual, but what would be the, is it three weeks, six weeks? Yeah, you're on the money there, Mark. You know, some people like literally, if you just stop running for two weeks and you just low gradually, it could just literally be four, six, eight weeks. It just really depends. Every physio might be slightly different. They might get you to run and just cut down your mileage and you still might be okay. I just like to go for two weeks, just give it a total break until it's not too tender when on the palpation or on touching clinic here. And then we'd obviously do all the strengthening exercises in those sessions. And then we'd go back to do more higher impact stuff. Because it is the higher impact stuff like running and jumping that really do create a lot of tension on the inside of that shin bone. So yeah, you're probably looking at four, six, eight, eight weeks max yeah, for sure. So there you go. If you've got chin splints, the guy I see is Simon Kelly. You can reach him at InSync Physio in Vancouver. You can book your appointment at 604-566-9716 or check out the website, InSyncPhysio.com. You can book online there. Or if you're in North Burnaby or the Burnaby area, they have a clinic there as well. You can reach them at 604-298-4878 or again, book online at InSyncPhysio.com. Thanks, Simon. Cheers, Mark. Thank you.